that there was nothing in the box. So it's not a collapse. There is still intrinsic value in the creative contribution of people into an economy. There is still creative value. It simply isn't on the scale that we believe it is. Listen, when in 1980, and this is a wonderful piece of history, in 1980, when the Stevenson-Widler Act was passed, all of you familiar with that one, very famous act in Congress in 1980, remember? Stevenson-Widler, remember? Th that was when we decided to announce to the world that we actually were the smartest. And, and by the way, we really did this. We actually passed an act that said, U.S. is going to be the world leader of technology, science, discovery, blah, 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 blah. And, and the good thing about it was the corollary to the Stevenson-Widler Act was the 1983 Act on International Competitiveness, and it was followed up by the 1986 Act, which actually reinforced the fact that what we were going to do under the Bayh-Dole Act and other provisions was we were going to prop up our university systems to tell us that we were all the smartest in the world. So it was a really good racket. For six years, we created an artificial world in which we said we can outsource jobs, we can outsource manufacturing, never worry. The U.S. is the ha haven for everything that's creative, everything that's knowledge, everything that's good happens here. What we forgot was during the same 1980 to 1986 time period, we opened up our universities to a thing called foreign students that came from South Korea, Taiwan, China, and India. Interestingly enough, they got smarter because they sat with some of our great professors, great engineers, great everything else, and guess what? They went home. And the ones that stayed went home after 9-11 because they were tired of being called terrorists. So they all went home. Now what we have is a situation where this isn't a collapse. This is just a level setting of expectations. We are not going to have an artificial economy that was propped up by fiat from Bretton Woods to the 1980 Stevenson-Widler Act to the current administration's, I don't even know what the act is. We're not going to have that anymore. Because it's not there, it doesn't mean that the system writ large collapsed. It means that the artifice, which was propped up as the stage prop that said we had an economy, yeah, that's gone. And the bummer is we lit it on fire. So yes, that's gone. Now, where does that go? Where it goes is we need to actually re-envision what it means to be creative. We need to figure out the delta between our projection to the world, what it is that we said we were, and what we actually are. If you look at my proposal, we specifically say, put intangibles on the balance sheet. Now, you know what? That's a painful exercise. Because what you're going to find out is a huge number of com companies actually don't have what they've told the investment community that they have. That's a bummer. That's a lie, but that's the way it is. It's a bummer. They they lied to us, and now we're going to find that out. Most people don't know that every, every company that sold major infrastructure to China had to do mandatory technology transfer. Now that I told you that, you're probably bummed about it because you were sitting there excited when you found out that they got a $3 billion contract or a $5 billion contract with the Chinese government, and now you're sitting there going, yes, they got that, but what did they option in the future? We're going to have to get that clarified. Does that mean it's over? No. Does it mean that the current incumbents who have actually perpetrated the thing are probably over? Yeah, it does. So what we'll see potentially in the very near future is the reemergence, I know this is going to shock people, of moving away from giant box stores, moving away from mass production, moving away from the notion that everything has to be produced centrally and distributed across a vast highway network system of 3,000 miles. We may actually have to build microenterprise again. I don't know that I find that to be an offensive proposition. And I actually don't believe that it is an offensive proposition. I think there's a whole lot of investors who would be more than happy to build a tool and die shop again. I think it would be very interesting to see if we could figure out a better way to do aluminum than burn through the electricity we burnt through for aluminum. I think there's a ton of things that are out there. So am I fundamentally pessimistic about collapses and things going away? No. What I am saying is we got some truth in advertising that we have to deal with. And it always is a bummer to be the guy at the end of the day who finds out, okay, they were selling us a bill of goods. Now we have to go back and say, what do we actually have? But there's something elegant about that. There's something wonderful about that. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not looking at this thing and saying it's the end of the world. I think the local bank, for example, 
the local bank that actually didn't build its business on manufacturing mass-produced mortgages is a very interesting place to invest now, the local bank. Not the mothership that can figure out all of the ways that it can do all of your tax preparations and everything. The local bank. I think the local consumer economy is a place you can invest again. I think it's a great place to put money. So I don't see that as a negative at all. I think it's a very opportunistic op moment in time where we can actually say, what is it that we value? So I would not be sanguine around an observation that says that this is a collapse. I think that it's kind of like Hollywood. Yeah, the wall fell over, but you find out it was just cardboard and a couple two by fours, and so it fell over. So then we pick ourselves up and say, well, it was a movie set. It was a movie set. It was designed by people who were in the movie business. Newsflash. That's their reality. So now we're back to the, now we got to do reality TV, not the movie set. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, it's a, it, it is one of the issues, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a very emotional piece of my world, because unfortunately, I get to do what I do in a lot of places in the world. So, so I've gotten to deal with places where decisions mean there are vast amounts of people who are going to die, literally die, before you solve the problem. And it sucks. I mean, it does. But in those spaces, you also find an opportunity which actually transforms where humanity, I think, is going to go. I think that we're going to have a situation, and we already have it, by the way. If you haven't looked at particularly the demographics around the hospital and hospice populations, which is a great place to get statistics, we already have a problem where the dehumanizing of end of life or late stage life, life has gone. We've actually already seen a shift in our society where it was far more expedient to actually move people further and further and further from family, from support infrastructure and everything else because there was a commodity approach to late life or end of life situations. Quite frankly, I'm gonna have a really harsh message around this. That was a bad decision. We as a society decided that disengagement at the inconvenience level was actually laudable. And we have got to deal with the morality of that question with open dialogue that says that there will be people for whom a high resource intensive environment is going to be required. There are people who require certain types of life support, assisted living, and those kinds of things. We as a society need to say that that's what the social net was there for, the safety net was there for. But the safety net was not constructed for convenience. When my wife and I built our house, we actually have a downstairs in the house that was built so that it could be accessible. You know why? Because my parents, one day, may actually need a place where they can actually live with us. Now that sounds nostalgic and Rockwellian and everything else, but guess what? It's actually what I believe is still of a value that we need to actually embrace. Will there be people for whom we need safety nets? Absolutely. But quite frankly, if America has to start caring for its elderly and its infirm and people with various types of disabilities, well, guess what? Welcome to being human. And as a person who spent a significant part of my life in a wheelchair and knows a lot about accessibility and knows a lot about what it's like to have your legs not work and be able to, I mean, we were just joking about it. The reason why I have the major I have in college is because I couldn't physically get in most of the buildings on campus. Hey, that's funny, huh? Prior to ADA, there you go. I get to have a major determined by my handicap status. Isn't that awesome? That's all about the American dream. You know what? I'm living the American dream, but I'm living the American dream not of a somebody else's projection. I'm living an American dream of my creation. And I think that we're, ba we're able. And by the way, you know what? I can guarantee you somebody in your neighborhood actually may just need 30 minutes or an hour respite from doing care with somebody in their house, okay? Not lifetimes of care, not ship them off to a retirement community or a nursing facility or anything else, just an hour, just two hours where you sit and read with somebody. 
I've had the good fortune of actually being at the bedside of people who are dying. And you know what the amazing thing is? That's not my job. But I actually found out that if you spend an hour reading to somebody who's in the last few days of their life, you actually make the last few days of their life really cool. So it sucks to be dying, but it also really is interesting to be alive. I don't think that a single one of us can look at ourselves and say, it would have been interesting if. If we're breathing, if we're walking, if we're interacting, then we are still in the game. We just got to figure out what the game is because it will be by our efforts that we'll actually start modeling behaviors that we can actually see reproduced in others. And maybe stop defining the elderly writ large as a consumer product that needs to be mass produced in assisted living. I mean, when you say it that way, it actually sounds really perverse. Kind of like prisons for profit sounds pretty perverse. Kind of like a bunch of other things sound pretty perverse. We're given an opportunity to re-find our humanity. That's a great opportunity. And you know what? You can teach me about it by invoking that presence into your question. So you did something to move the needle. Now you can do something else. It's not all on the macro scale. It doesn't have to be on the macro scale. But thank you for bringing that in because it's an important thing. From an investment standpoint, I think we need to be serious about the belief and the systems and everything else that says that the notion that we can sequester safe haven retirement funds and that's going to be how we keep the elderly in this country alive, I think that's ludicrous. Because we can't manage our treasury. If we can't manage our treasury, we are not going to manage our social welfare systems. And by the way, I haven't touched the liquidity of that, but that's not a good picture either. So we need to step up to the plate. And I think all of us who can cook, who can visit, who can read, who can share time, who can take somebody on a car ride, who can do any of those things, I think we can actually move the needle. I believe that. Yeah. Who, who are those people, and, and how, does it, how does it happen when we haven't even, I mean, we have bills we have yet to pay, and those aren't just going to evaporate. No, they're not. You're right. You know, the funny thing is, I started this presentation talking about the fact that we need to define value in more dimensions than currency. I believe that what we're going to have to do is actually take that seriously, number one, and number two, I think we're going to have to see ourselves as actually building what I said before, which is the emergence of alternative value unit transactability options. Let me tell you what one of those is. We're going to have a real issue with water. Okay? It's already a real issue. Some of us pretend that it's not because we still go to the tap and we turn it on and there's water. We are going to have a real issue with water. It's a strategic reserve issue, it's a strategic access issue, and at some point in time, you're going to have the ability, and it's not going to be too far away from now, it's already happening, by the way, in Dubai, where you actually exchange water contracts to make certain buildings habitable or not habitable. No money, no anything else, you're exchanging water contracts. Every piece of our economy is inextricably linked to the giant unspoken risk factor. I alluded to it earlier on, I alluded to it with ICAP, and if you want to dive into the numbers, you can dive into the numbers. The biggest exposure to the world in ICAP is the enhancements on municipal bonds. Now, municipal bonds are a funny thing. Everybody believes that they're the safe investment haven, and, you know, it's water, it's utilities, it's everything else. The fact of the matter is those things are credit enhanced up the, well, there's all kinds of things that they're credit enhanced up. The problem is all of those things have a fundamental liquidity problem. 
And so we're going to find that municipalities are increasingly going to go bankrupt. A lot of other people are going to go bankrupt. The system of reducing everything to currency is